you know, unlike the state or the federal government, the business of democracy in the city is done by the workhorse that we call the public hearing. Now, I go to lots and lots and lots of public hearings. As mayor, I get the best seat in the house. I can look out and see my fellow citizens and neighbors assembled to make uh, grand debates about the big questions of our urban metropolis. It's supposed to be just like Athens, <laughs> where we're doing important, meaningful stuff together as a community. That's what it's all about. That's what democracy is supposed to be. But what if you gave a democracy and nobody came? When I was first elected mayor, I would look out at my chambers, at the public hearing assembled, and I would see an empty room. I would be banging a gavel that seemed awfully loud to maintain order when there's no people in the place. And I would be frustrated. This seemed, seemed like democracy gone to failure. And I would wonder, we're doing big things. We're making important choices on behalf of the people of our community. Where are the citizens? How can you have a democracy with no citizens in your public hearings? Now, it is the case that we do set a pretty rigorous standard for what we think democracy is supposed to be like in cities. Our ideal conception of democracy still comes from this, this notion that everyone in the community, if we could, we'd all come together. Maybe we'd meet in the local NBA arena or the local AAA baseball park instead of on the Agora of Athens. But if we could, the ideal would be all of us come together and we'll have grand debates about the important uh, issues of our time and what the meaning of the good life really is in our cities. Now, I think intuitively we know we're too big, we're too outsized to deliver on a promise like this. So we know it's not possible. And we also know that the sheer diversity that essentially defines what a city is makes it impossible to have the kind of, of experience and perspective of values that you could have in Athens. And also we know that in no city in this country or even in the world are we all Greeks, not even in Athens. In no city are we all just property-owning men. The diversity makes it impossible to have this kind of notion that we could all just come together and have a civil debate about grand issues of moral philosophy and then translate them into today's world. But even though it's not possible to have Athenian democracy in local communities, it's still kind of the implicit standard by which we're judging our elected leaders and really our sense of democratic virtue as a people. And the public hearing is supposed to be that. It's supposed to deliver on what Athens should be in today's modern world. But instead, we get something entirely different, where no one is coming. Now, why should they? If you walk into a public hearing tonight, 6 o'clock, you'll probably go home at midnight. If you walk into a public hearing tonight, what you will hear it will make you think that you're in a United Nations meeting without a headset to translate. Because it's all in jargon, written by attorneys and engineers and planners and accountants. Nothing that is about the grand issues of our time. If you go into a public hearing tonight, uh, you will have already missed the whole story. You're walking in at the end of the line. The decision that's being made, the decisions that are required in public hearings are the actual discrete, concrete action that must occur. The zoning decision, the liquor license. That's the vote that's happening. That's the discussion that's supposed to be occurring. But the whole story is already played out. Long before that point, in the planning process, in the strategy process, in the visioning process, is when the conversation was happening about what do we want to see happen, the zoning is just making that occur at the last moment. It's just the implementation. Going to a public hearing and expecting to participate in public democracy is like going to a movie when the final credits are rolling and expecting the plot. But that's not what it gets delivered because that's not what they're for. Now, public hearings could deliver so much more but there's no one there. It's not a surprise. Almost all of the time, almost all of the people in any community are not there. They don't know about the public hearing. They don't want to know about the public hearing. If they went to a public hearing, they're not going to make the same mistake twice. <laughs> the only people in the room are those that have some kind of economic interest before the city that's at stake that night in the public hearing, or a gadfly whose cable is out at home and can't watch Real Housewives, so this is the next best alternative or a college student who has a mandatory assignment from their government class to learn something about how a local government works. That's it. That's what we've been left with. And in the land of the midnight public hearing, it's the citizens with no life that are king. So what we're, what we're left with is a decision-making process that doesn't allow us to have a real democratic dialogue about anything that really matters. Now, part of it is the way that we construct city choices in the first place and the nature of what happens in a city. Rarely are we voting on declarations of war or Roe versus Wade or some grand issue that sits all by itself. 
choices in the city are much more complicated. One of my most common requests from constituents is, why don't you put a fill in the blank at the corner of fill in the blank and fill in the blank? So why don't you put an Argentinian restaurant at the corner of Fifth and Broadway? I would love to have an Argentinian restaurant. Mr. Mayor, deliver that. As though as mayor, I could say, let there be Argentinian restaurants, <laughs> and out of the sky would drop an Argentinian restaurant tomorrow. Now that's the request, that's the value, that's the thing that would enliven the neighborhood, the restaurant district for that individual constituent, that individual voter. But an Argentinian restaurant as a decision doesn't exist all by itself. There's no public hearing that I have to say, Argentinian restaurant, yes or no. An Argentinian restaurant is a function of things like, well, can you build a restaurant on this site at all? Is that allowed? And if it's allowed, is it encouraged? What is the taxes like for an Argentinian restaurant? Can you walk to the site? Is anybody going to want to go buy food at an Argentinian restaurant? <laughs> Have you built enough housing around it? Have you created a restaurant district? Well, a restaurant district only functions if you have walkability and transit services and bike parking. But if you were the citizen that came to the public hearing on parking ratios and said, I want that area around Fifth and Broadway to have plenty of free parking so I can get in and out whenever I want to. If you came there for the public hearing and said, I want plenty of parking. If you came to the public hearing on right-of-way acquisition and said, please build Broadway as wide as possible because I want to be able to drive down Broadway with no traffic at any time whatsoever. If you came to the public hearing and said at 4th and Broadway, I'm utterly opposed to building a high-density housing project, an apartment complex at 4th and Broadway, that's not the kind of neighborhood that I want. If you came to all those individual public hearings, and then at the end of the process, do not be surprised that you will never, ever get your Argentinian restaurant. You will not have a restaurant district. The creation of the district depends on an almost infinite number of antecedent decisions that have to get made. And those decisions are the hard ones. They're not the fun ones. No one comes and says, build more density. No one comes and says, put a methadone clinic on the corner of my block. No one ever says those things. But what they want is a walkable place. What they want is a great downtown. What they want is a healthy community. And those depend on those individual decisions. Having public hearings about just those things, density, 14 units to the acre, 18 units to the acre, what do you think? That's what we do. And those public hearings are sort of like being on a diet and the, where the public hearing is the midnight trip to the refrigerator. You know it's not the, exactly the right thing, but in the moment when you have to rely just on your gut, that's what you want. You want that chocolate cake. And in the moment, what you want is plenty of free parking and wide streets. And so if you're asked, that's what you will say, even though you may have the sense that that's going to defeat the possibility of the kind of walkable restaurant district that you really ultimately desire. So, the choices are the wrong ones. We ask the wrong questions in the public hearing, and then we wonder why we don't get the kind of partition, participation that we would like to see. And no one does come. And, and, and the result is no participation and frustration with the ultimate decisions that occur, and less and less and less in participation, not just in the hearings themselves, but even in the process of elections, because no one gets the connection between their participation in a democracy and the results that they ultimately are able to see. Now, I know uh, for a lot of folks the answer is, and it was for me when I first became mayor, is transparency. When I first got to my first public hearing as mayor, I'm like, there's nobody here. What we need to do is get some outreach going. We need to let people know that this important decision is happening about changing zoning from 14.2 units to the acre to 15.6 units to the acre. Uh, public information officer, let's put some, you know, let's put something out on the internet. Well, that didn't exist then, but let's put some flyers up that tell people that this public hearing is occurring. Let's have more transparency. Let's provide more information. Well, it turns out that's not really a great strategy because it actually makes it worse. It isn't that there aren't enough choices for citizens to make. There are plenty of them. And in fact, when I was sitting in that public hearing, in my own hearing, thinking, gee, where is everyone else? I'm an informed person. I believe in government. I'm doing my civic duty by being at this public hearing. Where are all the rest of the people? We need to tell them about it. But at that same point, when I was having my city council hearing, down the road, the school board was having a hearing, too. No one was there. The county board of supervisors having its hearing a few miles away, talking about what to do about library hours. My local congressman was probably having his office hours down at the coffee shop. And no one was at any of those places. Shame on the citizens. And then it hit me. I'm not in any of those other people's hearings, either. Maybe I'm, a, am I a bad citizen for not going to the school board hearing and the county hearing and the congressman's office hours? I just happen to be at this one. If you think the answer is transparency, telling people about more and more and more and more hearings, then, what you, then you're going to be very disappointed because there are an infinite number 
of local government decisions to be made at any one moment. And simply providing transparency makes it more complicated. It makes it more daunting. It makes it feel as though you have too much complexity, too many choices to make. And I think as we know from neuroscience now, having too much choice can be disabling. We're causing cognitive shutdown of our constituents to the point where they just say, I'm not going to participate at all. I have other things to do that are going to be more productive with my time than go to a million public hearings. I love it. Uh, it's essential to a free press. It's a public accountability. But it isn't the answer to engaging citizens. And in fact, there are trade-offs between providing more and more details, more reductionism about how government really works, and the, the possibility of engaging citizens in what their future might look like. Now, it isn't just the hearings. Part of the challenge is that we have borrowed our design for government at the city level, for urban democracy, from a model that it was never intended for. You know, if you read the U.S. Constitution, one word that you will never see anywhere in the Constitution or in any of the amendments is the word city. Right? There was no design, there was no grand design from the founders around how cities would be governed. We just happen to have borrowed that form of government, the, the, the form of governing that the federal government has, and applied it willy-nilly to cities. But the, here's the challenge. That model was put in place to stop action. The whole point of the federal system, with its checks and balances, its distribution of power all over the place, its endless processes and opportunities for reconsideration, is to not make mistakes, to not let the mob of the public move too quickly in the process of change. But for cities, cities, we are hotbeds of action. We thrive on action. We depend on action. We celebrate change or we die. Cities must progress. We must move forward. And so a system of government that is designed to not act is exactly the wrong solution for cities. Uh, and so as sometimes we think about a, a local city council as a Congress. It's not a Congress at all. It has to be as nimble, as adept, as neighborhood associations, as local businesses, as entrepreneurs, as the problems and the opportunities that we face in local cities. So we need a different kind of government uh, in, our, in local communities that can make democracy come alive. Not, ch not tweaking it here and there, not a little bit more outreach, not a little more process, not another task force, not a charter revision, but a fundamental change in what we think of how democracy should work in the urban context. Now, there is some uh, uh, encouraging possibilities. I think we need an urban democracy 2.0 a whole new operating system. Turn off the old democracy, start over, plug in a new 2.0 operating system that would allow us to think about city democracy in an entirely different way. And the bits and pieces of that are already out there. We're starting to see the source code for what that operating system might look like. Now, in uh, Egypt and Iceland, they're already experimenting with different ways of engaging public uh, participation in a real democracy. So they borrowed the sort of crowdsourcing model, editing model of Wikipedia and applied it to rewriting their constitutions. Right, so they put drafts of their constitutions online and citizens of, of the countries uh, can edit and change and comment in real time with one another. Now, it's only a start, it's not a transformation, it's, it's informing, not transforming democracy in the sense that ultimately, even after this Egyptian con constitution gets done, it still goes to an elite committee of parliament uh, that then does it in, in a closed session somewhere. There's, it's still the same system of decision, but it's better informed by the public. And so you could see the possibilities here that perhaps someday you could have a crowdsourced approach to making public policy. And then there's crowdfunding, which is already sweeping the country. Little places like Hilo in the, in the state of Hawaii, which is about the same size as my city, um, but also in, in cities like Baltimore and D.C., Seattle, all across the country, where this notion of crowdfunding is really taking off. And it's based on the notion that Kickstarter began. Let's let people uh, look at projects, and they can propose new projects in our, in our cities and our communities, and then we'll put them out there for everybody to see and to comment on and to tweak and to vote on and to click like on. It's really interesting and promising, partly because it uses visuals in ways that I think are really critical. It sounds easy, pictures, that's simple, but pictures are powerful. The sensory approach to engaging citizens as opposed to the density, 14.2 or 15.6 units per <laughs> the acre. In these models, you show what is the downtown that you want it to look like. What does a restaurant district look like versus what does a skyscraper office district look like? Which one do you want? What is the value to you? And then we'll deliver on that as opposed to asking you to assess a density equation. So they're really powerful in their sense of the use of visuals. 
Now, they're great, but they are not perfect, right? Because you're getting fairly uh, superficial responses with these lights. And here's a good example of a model. So you could say, a lot of this feels like hot or not to me, which, uh, where you can go online and you can and look at a picture and you just have to click yes or, yes or no, or maybe hot or not. It's a very simple way to engage. It's the sort of thing that you could do in line while you're waiting for the barista to make your cappuccino. Um, it's the sort of thing that you could do in between shifts at your job. Um, that's quick, that provides an opportunity to express your preferences, express your opinions, that's very fast. So, and, and it's certainly possible to think about applying this at the civic scale. And in fact, that's essentially what these crowdfunding models are all about, is providing an opportunity, quick opportunities for citizens to engage in real decisions in a way that is meaningful but does not require them to take the entire night off and sit through endless amounts of jargon. So this is out there, and they're, they're very uh, promising. But they're, and I would love to do them in my own city. So if there's any coders in here that want to come and help us build some of these in, our own, in my city, I'd love to have you, because there's tremendous potential. But they're not everything, at least not yet. All right, so if you look at, 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 this is a great example of why I think there's potential, but some constraints. So it's easy to envision and to engage citizens in clicking and liking uh, tree planting, working with blind children, fixing up bikes, cleaning up graffiti. It's the cute choices, it's the easy choices, right? There's no such site like this that says, where should the sewer plant go? <laughs> Which neighborhood should be home to the cattle rendering facility that we must have so that we can have locally sourced organic beef? There's no site that says, how do we day to day balance between our commitment to public safety and our desire to protect our civil liberties? Right, the real tough issues of government are not all about whether you build an urban garden on this site or whether you put a bike lane through it. And so I think the evolution of how technology is being applied to bring social decision-making, social choice to government and to democracy has to evolve beyond simply the cute, the cuddly, the birds and the babies and the bunnies to the real tough choices that governments actually face. And we're starting to see some of this in other places that are, that are trying to put, put their toe in. Not with choices, not with voting, but at least letting you know that there are riots in Tottenham that have started uh, that you want to learn about. We're not going to ask you your opinion about it, but, they, but we are acknowledging that not everything in our community is about bike lanes and gardens. So there's real promise here, and we should be doing a lot about it. Now, a lot of what's happening so far is about how do you build a better suggestion box? Uh, how do you make government more efficient? How do you deal with quality assurance issues? Places like Code for America and the urban mechanics shops and a lot of city halls that are popping up across the country are focused on sort of changing democracy in the sense that in addition to democracy being about voting and voicing your opinions, that maybe you can express your citizenship by action, by actually doing things and in so participating in governance in a way that isn't just about submitting a speaker card at a public hearing. The source code's already there for an urban democracy 2.0. Now we just have to figure out some additional design principles to bring it to reality. I think the first one, and it's one that I think a lot of folks struggle with, is that we have to rethink what citizenship itself means. That we're so used to thinking of citizenship 100% based on where do you sleep each night. So I sleep in West Sacramento. Uh, that means I'm a 100% citizen there. Uh, I might come to a museum in Sacramento. I might have a job in Sacramento. I might eat uh, dinner every other night in Sacramento. I might come to the play in Sacramento. I'm a 0% citizen in a city where I might spend a third of my day or a third of the week. I'm a 100% citizen in the place that I sleep, as though that's all that matters. If I were to invest in building that Argentinian restaurant in Fifth and Broadway, and it happens to be at the city next door, I have no state as a citizen in that city. That is not necessary anymore. In Athens, in colonial New England, in the history of the city, the correspondence between where you sleep, where you work, where you play, where you die, where you marry, was easy. That is no longer the case, and our notion of what citizenship is has to evolve to account for the fact that our lives cross municipal boundaries in important ways. Second is that we need to stop asking people what they think about everything directly. As Steve Jobs says, you would never get the iPad or the iPhone if you ask people what do you want. Sometimes uh, setting up mechanisms, designing tools and games that reveal preferences rather than ask people things like density 4.2 versus 15.6 is a much more effective way of finding out what people actually want and need. 
Preference revelation can be much more effective than preference interrogation. Next is we have to deal with the challenge that democracy is not all about bunnies and it's not all consensus, it's not all nice and fun. That we have to embrace the fact that it's a challenge. These are complex issues and I will disagree with most of you most of the time. And it is the collision <laughs> between people and ideas in the city that makes urban life worth living, that makes urban life special. It is the challenge, it's the collision, it's being forced to address the fact that you are not the only person in the world, that your, your views are not the only ones. These social tools uh, that are being developed today to change the way that we interact with government have to not avoid that question. They have, to, they have to embrace it, they have to draw us into the debate, into the learning and into the adaptation. Finally, uh, we have to focus on the stuff that matters, that cities are about important democratic choices and not just about whether or not zoning allows backyard chickens but around the questions of what is this city compared to a different city? What is the core values that make us as the residents of this urban metropolis? And then importantly, democracy has to lead to an end, an end. The decisions of democracy have to complete in an action. You cannot have endless public hearings that lead to more public hearings and then more public hearings. At some point in an effective democratic system, the decision must come to an end because in the city, Unlike apparently the US Congress, action must occur. Tomorrow, someone must pick up the trash. Tomorrow, someone has to know, can I get a permit for my Argentinian restaurant? And that's what city democracy has to promise on. And so that's our question, is who among us is ready to start redesigning democracy, to start not tweaking it, not making it slightly more efficient than it used to be, but really rethinking what democracy is for, what it's all about, and how we can harness it to make our cities better places to live. All right, now who wants to go get some Argentinian food? <laughs>